Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Let's Play Mega Man ZX Advent. In the last part, we took care of the Tower of Verdur and gained a new A-Trans ability in Rosepark, as well as met two Mega Man that had very familiar biometals. And now, before we go, we'll take care of the second of the first two major levels. We might as well come back over to Kid and give him 200 energy crystals. By and large, as long as you're killing enemies along the way, the missions you get, uh, complete should give you, give you enough energy crystals to do most of the side quests in the game. There's only a couple I feel you'll probably need to grind for. And even then, I feel the grinding is only really necessary on expert mode, which you don't unlock until after you've beaten the game anyway, so not much to worry about there. Now, there is a distinct reason I'm taking the level order I am in this LP. And it's not just with these first two, I'm talking in general. And it's not really a weakness chain like it is in the other games. Especially since I don't really tend to use the elemental weaknesses in ZX Advent so much. It mostly comes down to the convenience of grabbing items. I, I really do look at the going through the levels in this order more closer to a, Mega Man, uh, a Metroid game than a Mega Man game. Which is weird, because in a lot of ways, this game isn't as Metroid-like as ZX Original. Can you hear me? It's me, Mikhail. It looks like you've stepped into some rough terrain. You should be able to cut a path through the chunks of ice. But the areas that allow access to the crash site are limited. Mega Man, you must find a way to break through. The Arctic Ice Flow is our ice level for the game, but you don't really need to worry about the ice too much, as well. the ice itself is absurdly slippery. You can be underwater for a lot of it, which just allows you to ignore it. Plus, you can destroy most of the ice blocks with fire attacks like Buckfire's fire arrows. So you can just ignore a lot of the main mechanic here. Though, I should warn you that controlling Buckfire is a little awkward in that his main movement is dashing. He doesn't really have a normal walking speed. If you press the dash button with him, he just does a bit of a dash attack. That is what you see his antlers glowing for. And you can use that to kill enemies. In fact, there's even a certain reward for beating the next boss fight with using that as the killing blow. The big thing is we're just using him to get around the ice physics, more or less. I should note, uh, the other weird thing to control about him is his wall jump. If you compare it to, say, the normal wall jump found in Mega Man from X on, where you cling to a wall and can just bounce on the same one over and over again, Buckfires is closer to how Metroids works, particularly Metroid Fusion, where he bounces from left to right, wall to wall, and needs to switch which buttons you're controlling each time. Either way, it's time for the mini boss of this level. Uh, it's this octopus. We need to destroy the main core, but the main core only opens up if you destroy the tentacles. Thankfully, the tentacles are taken out with one of Buckfires' arrows, so it's pretty quick to take out. Uh, by and large, the, mega, the, the mini bosses in ZX Advance are much easier to take out than the ones in ZX Original because ZX Originals can be a bit too healthy for their own good in most cases. I'm especially thinking of those dragons. I feel in general the game does a better job of using your transformations either for mobility or for combat in this game, as while particularly uh, Model HX in ZX Original was very good for movement. LX wasn't used too much, PX was only used in a couple rooms. I feel they do a better job of making the abilities of the individual pseudoroids more useful in the long run here. At least earlier on. <laughs> it's cold. I should have dressed warmer. Uh, are you a hunter too? My name's Mary. Nice to meet you. Oh, what am I gonna do? I caught a moth queen, but it got away. Ah, won't someone catch it for me? Wink. So we need to catch that Moth Queen seen at the top of the screen. There are two notable ways you can do this. You can jump on the left or right walls in this area and then wall jump off towards it if it's close enough. Or you can just do the smarter thing, I feel, and do a vertical charge with Buckfire to catch it once close enough. My Moth Queen, you caught it for me. You are a hunter. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you came to my aid. It isn't much, but I want you to have this. And we get 100 free energy crystals for that. Not too bad, given the time involved. They say Moth Queens are popular with celebrities because they're so beautiful. I'm gonna sell these beauties to earn enough money so they become a hunter someday. By and large, again, getting energy crystals in ZX Advent isn't too hard. Uh, I'd say I usually end a playthrough with an extra couple of thousand anyway. It's only really in expert mode where you can use a lot of them because they quintuple the price of each of the warp points. And I think they also make other methods of using them a bit more expensive as well. Don't quote me on that part, though. Now, I should note, in the case you see pathways of not going down like that one on the bottom right, or another one-way, one-tile passageway directly above me that I didn't look at, 
It's because either we can't get or there's nothing I need at the end of them. By and large, a lot of the optional pathways in the game just leave the secret discs, and that's the only thing I'm not getting 100% in. Uh, because there's really no point to it. You don't get anything for doing it. It's just extra dialogue. I'm getting 100% in everything else, just not that. Well, it's sort of 100% even then. Because, uh, for instance, the side quests. I'm doing every single one I can as Grey. There's a side quest that is exclusive to the other playable character, Ash, during the last stages of the game. And I'll talk about that when we get to it, but yeah. Either way, this is the reason I played the levels in the order I have thus far. If you have Rose Spark by the time you reach this point in the Arctic Ice Flow, you can get your first of the four sub-tanks in the game. Sub-tanks work the same way they do in Mega Man X1 onwards. If you're at full HP and you collect health pickups, that excess energy is drained into that and you can use it as an extra health refill at any point you wish. And like the X-Series, it's not a full drain of the sub-tank whenever you use it, it just drains to whatever HP point you need. Getting them is extremely important. With that said, if you're playing on Expert Mode, good luck, because you only get one of them. Uh, and it's the hardest to get one in the game, technically, because it's the one that needs a very long side quest to get. More on that later, though. Now, in this part of the Arctic Ice Flow, it's a little weird. we got a bit of a maze here where we need to find various power generators and shut them down. There are six total, but you only need to shut down five, because the sixth one is hidden behind a type of block we cannot break yet. In fact, that extra generator is only used in the very side quest I just mentioned that is Ash exclusive. Uh, because there's a door on the top right of the area you need to open to go talk to an NPC in that side quest. But well, that's not going to be matter here at all, honestly. If you want to see playthroughs of the game as Ash, I'm not going to be doing one myself. Uh, but I believe... Uh, Clement, the, uh, one of the more prominent Mega Man LPers, did the game as Ash, so if you want to see the game's cutscenes as that character, I'd recommend that. It'll also give you a good view on the game's voice acting on the DS version, because, uh, that's entirely the compressed audio. It is admittedly really weird seeing the remastered cutscenes and hearing the uncompressed audio in ZX Advent for this playthrough. Because, like I mentioned back in part one, ZX Advent is a game I've been playing for years. I played it before the original ZX, even. And... I'm so used to hearing the compressed of everything that it just almost sounds wrong. Like hearing, well, how is that lock coming? Without hearing it sounding like it's being put through like an AM radio six layers at a time. It's weird. With that said, we're coming up on the boss fight. I could recommend go switching to Buckfire for it, but you don't really need it, honestly. Prometheus said he found someone interesting. I came to see who it was. Thetis, he's nothing more than a kid, like you. Hey, you're not that much older than me. Well, what is it with you people? Didn't Prometheus tell you that you'd meet other Mega Men? My name is Thetis, the Ice Mega Man, chosen one for Model L. I'm Atlas, the Flame Mega Man, chosen one for Model F. Don't tell me you don't know about the Game of Destiny, in which the winner becomes the king of the world. King of the world? This just gets bigger and bigger! Look, I don't care about that. All I know is that if I beat them, I get to find out who I am and where I came from. Sorry, I'm not in the mood to fight you right now. We've got other things to do. I've got no time for some kid who became a Mega Man by accident. You look like you could use a nice cold dip. Welcome to my Sub-Zero world, where even time freezes. You've got some nerve calling yourself a Mega Man defective. I, Chronoforce, 
will take that biometal off your hands. Man, Model F and L got jacked too. Vent, Ale, what are you two doing? With that said, time for Chrono Force, which can be one of the trickier boss fights in a first playthrough, as while he moves left to right and just sticks to the extreme left and right, his main attacks might seem to just be firing icicles at you or spawning in the ground and then firing three mini Chrono Forces at you. His big thing is he has his own charge attack, which slows down time for you, not him. He now moves a lot faster, his attacks are a lot more aggressive. It's rough to dodge him at this phase, especially on expert mode. In fact, I'd say this is the hardest boss fight of the game on expert mode. Because he starts the entire fight like this and does extra points to his attacks. Like, the icicle attack he's doing right now, he fires one wave and then another, so you need to kind of warm your way between them. It's rough. It's not a hard fight. In fact, right here is the hardest fight in the game. Where he fires icicles in eight directions. If you get too close to them, they split off into miniatures that go to the four intercardinals. And then he reverses time, making everything that just happened go back in reverse, even the reforming of the icicles. Dodging that can be hard, especially in expert mode, where I think their speed is like triple or some shit. This can be a hard fight, especially with the amount of health if you didn't get the life up from the Tower of Verdor. But if you're good enough with taking your time and staying a good distance away from him, I'd say dodging most of his attacks isn't too bad. I do take a lot of dumb hits in this LP, though. You're nothing more than a pawn in the palm of his hand. All you can hope to do is just flail about in the little time you have left. <laughs> this he, his, him guy everyone keeps talking about. I bet he's the one calling the shots behind those other Mega Men. Game of Destiny, King of the World. This is all getting complicated. And with that, we now have the ability to transform into Chrono Force, who is one of the more limited pseudoroids, but still one of the most useful in the game. You've got Chrono Force's power. Morph into Chrono Force and you can use swim in the water all the time. Use the D-pad to move around the water, and then use the dash button to propel yourself quickly through the current. Press the attack button to shoot an ice arrow and freeze enemy salt, but be careful on land, you'll become totally immobile. Chrono Force's hard shell protects him from attacks from above. Just get under one of those falling icicles and see. So Chrono Force can swim in all eight directions, no problem. You can get some good speed. Chrono Force's charge attack is awesome. Hold down the attack button until the meter is fully charged, then release it to activate the Time Bomb. Time Bomb freezes time for everything around you. And slows down the movement of enemies. Cool, huh? Oh, yeah, it's not only enemies that slow down. You can use Time Bomb to slow down falling objects like icicles. So it's a little bit of a misnomer. It doesn't freeze time. It does just speed you up and slow everything else around you down tremendously. For instance, on these icicles that are instant kill, it just slows them down. He's not good for mobility. But the thing is about the Time Bomb is that it's the most useful thing in the game, especially on extra mode. It slows down everything. Boss fights included. It's borderline obscenely broken. Uh, I think it can even be used to slow down the final boss. So yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty good. It's pretty good. <laughs> I don't use it much throughout the LP because I feel it'd just be not fair to the game. But if you ever play the game on expert mode, use that on every boss fight moving forward because it'll just be the best way to beat the game. Hey, With that said, we're now at the juncture point between the Verdur Tower and the Arctic Ice Flow. We're now back in this area where we need to use the three elements we've gotten thus far between Fire with Buckfire, uh, Electricity with, with Rose Spark, and Ice with Chrono Force in order to destroy the three elemental guards here and allow us to access the next area. This is their way of sort of railroading you in this game. You have a couple points in the game where you can access upwards of four stages at a time, but you need to have beaten them all before you can progress onward in the game. And it's their way of sort of making this sort of a Metroid, but not really. It's weird. They do better with using mobility in each of the stages between your various transformations, I feel. But to do that, they made it less Metroid-like, and it's weird how they managed to balance it like that. Elemental switches deactivated. Safety locks disengaged. 
So now we can move on further in the oil field area. But with that, if memory serves, I'm going to need to end this off here. Thank you guys for watching, and in part 5, we're going to be checking out the oil field proper and seeing what awaits us within its very oil ocean-y aesthetics. See you guys then.